Okay. I just want to say, like, it, th there's a lot of synchronicity going on. Field, I'm an ex-aircraft engineer. I used to keep uh, people like uh, Field McConnell flying safely. And uh, I was born in Belfast. So we've got, like, a Belfast contingent here doing stuff. There's a lot of fighting spirit in Belfast, isn't there? Now it seems to be put in a good direction. And all the communities coming together about their real enemies. Um, and child abuse, yeah? Child abuse seems to be, like, pivotal in stuff you've heard uh, in the media now, it's all coming out. Um, it starts, and obviously some of you don't know my story, which I've only got half an hour, so I'll just hit it very briefly. So child abuse, its cover-up, and the corruption are quite sort of central to all, a lot of the stuff that we are doing. It seems to be a sort of common glue, this child abuse. There's a raft of revelations in the papers uh, of endemic cover-up for decades and decades. Now... We, as, as normal, decent people, we can't tolerate this. Now, my experience started in 2008. I was bringing up my daughter, single father, my 14-year-old daughter. But from 7 to 14, I brought her up. And I discovered she was being online uh, sexually groomed. Real serious stuff. So like any normal person who reported it to the police. And the police's reaction was incredible. What the police did is no investigation. And after two weeks, when they haven't come and collect a PC or anything like that, I decided to call them up and find out what's going on. Very politely and thankfully, and I'd suggest to anyone who's doing it here, unfortunately, we've got to record ourselves. The calls were recorded that I made to the police. The upshot of that was, two days later, after I'd made these phone calls, the police dawn raided my house at half past six in the morning, making claims I'd harassed the borough commander's secretary on the telephone. Completely bogus allegations. Now, on the, the issue, so it's quite central to what, I, what I'm about, yeah, is back in 2008, I realised these people aren't investigating child abuse. Why not? But they'll chase you down for a £40 parking ticket. Now, I know the UK column put that up as a, a comment I put up on my Facebook, which is obviously very well followed, and social media, that... Britain's the only country where chasing a parking ticket is a higher priority than chasing paedophiles. Now, obviously, I've found out subsequently that, of course, Britain's not the only country, and lots of people have reminded me that US, uh, Belgium, all across the world, yeah, Australia, New Zealand, it's the same, same pattern across the world. Um, okay, so when I get acquitted at trial, when I produce the tape recordings that show that the statements against me were completely false. Again, like a good, dutiful citizen, I thought, well, there's a police complaints authority, or police com the, the IPCC. They'll be okay. So I reported it to them, and gave them all the evidence that had been prepared for the court case. And it started off well. A guy called Derek Braddon, who's the director, was then director of uh, the IPCC, uh, who's now gone, probably because he was an okay guy. Uh, he can't tolerate that. He said, look, this is serious, and this needs to be a managed investigation, one of only about 80 a year. It then fell into the hands of a commissioner of the IPCC, long time served, now a government ombudswoman for Melbourne in Australia, uh, Deborah Glass, okay? Now, Deborah Glass took hold of that investigation and steered it away from a criminal investigation. Now, can we play? Uh, some of you might have heard this, <clears throat> but... Um, on, on this, Deb, this is Deborah Glass speaking. Uh, I had a meeting with her in Parliament after I started a private criminal prosecution, which I'll come on to in a moment. But Deborah Glass had covered up this, uh, what I believe to be a very serious crime of perverting the course of justice, uh, saying that in the, in the report that she signed off, that it was at most simply a mistake that this false statement had come into creation. I had a, when I started the private prosecution, she very desperately wanted to meet me and uh, she hadn't wanted to meet me prior to that, but she wanted to meet me now, and I met her with my, my MP in Parliament, and I recorded the, the whole meeting. There's lots more juicy bits to come out, but I haven't put them out yet. I like to tease. But uh, have a listen to this. What this Deborah Glass, she's been in 10 years in the IPCC, what she says herself about the police complaints. You know, because you know, one of the things that I, I, I do absolutely accept is that the police complaint system is not very effective. 
So I absolutely accept that the police complaint system is not very effective. She's the commissioner of it. Now, I did check out that she never brought her concerns to the board level of the IPCC, and it's confirmed she didn't. But this is the commissioner who's sitting on all of your investigations into police misconduct, and she knows it's not very effective. I'd say it's probably because she was the head of it, but there you go. Let's go back to this. Play. Play? Okay. It's an apple. Don't do apple. Okay. So what happened is IPCC, look at this investigation. They say it was all simply a mistake. Go away. There's nothing to see here. Blah, blah, blah. And it's typical of all of the cover-ups of the you know, child abuse victims who came here and spoke yesterday that they're going to supposed authorities who are supposed to be charged with actually protecting them, investigating and bringing offenders to justice, yeah? Um, and they don't. These people turn a blind eye, they cover up even in the face of compelling evidence, yeah? And surely someone must have asked the question in the IPCC, why were they raiding this man, this father, who had reported child abuse to the police at half past six in the morning on bogus allegations? But of course to them... They, they weren't concerned. But I think at the time they thought that I kept a low profile at the time. I wanted to see what these people would do because I expected they would try and cover it up. And then what I did is do the, I think it's one of the sort of first private criminal prosecutions. In 2011, I go to Luton Crown Court, uh, Luton Magistrates Court. I take the very same evidence that's gone before the IPCC. I put it into a case file, pair it up, and I go to the Magistrates Court. And I say, I want a summons for this individual to appear before the court for the charges of perverting the course of justice, perjury, misconduct in public office. And it was a very interesting afternoon. And when you talk about the spiritual side of things, I certainly see and, uh, what does he say, let them see signs or whatever, but around all of the stuff that goes on, I think when you're on the right path, you see signs and things will happen and things will move into place to keep you on that right track. And certainly on that Friday afternoon, the whole court came to watch what, I was doing. None of them knew what I was doing in court. I'm just some daft aircraft engineer. And they all went, came in to have a look at the whole court, every single lot of them on a Friday afternoon. And I presented the case to the, to the court and said, I want this summons. The judge went off for about an hour uh, to think about it. And the, the duty solicitor came out with me. Uh, I still know him to this day. And he said, do you know what? What I just watched you do in there, after 20 years being a solicitor, I now know what my job's about. So, hopefully, he'll often talk to me about the corruption in the courts and stuff like that. And I, I've met many good people on the way who are in the system. Now, the judge came out and said, Mr. Doherty, I'm going to give... He said, this is going to cause a lot of trouble, but I'm going to give you your summons, yeah? And that started off, since two, April 2011, a whole series of events that's just continued, and it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. It exposes the corruptions in the courts. There are good people trying to do a good thing in the courts, but, you know, we, it, it comes from all sides. You know, I've been... I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the, the case is then sent off to the Crown Court because obviously an indictable offence. <clears throat> in October 2011, four days prior to the police barristers put in a dismissal application, try and get the case thrown out of court, saying, you know, there's no merit in this case. Four days prior to that, in London... My sister-in-law, who's a head teacher in London, gets approached by a male in, in a suit and handed a letter. And that letter was making threats against me that if I didn't stop what I'm doing, we won't let this happen, yeah? Now, of course, that was reported to the police. It was probably the guy in the suit was from the police. <laughs> and they say, well, there's nothing to investigate here, and that to this date, they've never investigated that. So, obviously, to try and put stress and pressure on me, it's the first time I've ever been in a Crown Court, uh, probably won't be the last, but it was certainly the first. And um, we go in there, and I win the dismissal application. And I can say it now because the, the case is over now, and I'll come to that in a moment. The case is over now, but um, at the moment, the judge, in his deliberation, strikes out that dismissal application and says that the evidence you know, that he sees is presented is compelling evidence, yeah? This matter ought to go to trial. So the very same evidence that the IPCC said look, there's, no, there's not even a criminal offence here, is now in the Crown Court before a judge, in the transcripts, this is compelling evidence. Now, I think Ian was there. And um, anyway, case then goes on, set down for plea hearing. Uh, at the 11th hour, up rocks, 
uh, Richard Newcomb, Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor of the CPS, who's now, who is a Mason, who's now resigned, when I found out was presented with the Masonic Yearbook and found out he was in the Masonic Yearbook and emailed it in through the CPS contact uh, department, asked, Mr Newcomb, could you confirm that that's, this is your lodge and this is identifying you, Richard A. Newcomb. <laughs> Very shortly after that, he resigned, took retirement. But anyway, so Richard Newcomb tried to stop the case, saying that there wasn't evidence, enough evidence to uh, have a realistic prospect of conviction. That then went into the High Court and spent about two years running around the High Court before the CPS entered into a consent order to not get involved in the prosecution. Then the prosecution went back on. And last September, 15th of September last year, it was set down for trial. At trial, they produced a, their barrister, um, Valerie Charbit. If you look up Valerie Charbit, Two Bedford Row, her expertise is she's one of the leading in the country barristers for arguing a defendant's inability to stand trial due to mental problems. So it's obvious where they were going with it. Even if it got to the doors of the trial, this person wasn't going to stand trial anyway. But they came on the day of the trial, a whole load of new legal arguments. It got adjourned again till the 21st of October last year. And we're talking about human rights, that they're supposed to be protecting human rights. Well, what happened on that? On the 21st of October, the CPS started becoming involved again. Um, despite signing a consent order that they wouldn't get involved, they then were told by the judge, look, if you're going to do anything, you need to tell us by the 14th of October. At 4 p.m. on the day before the next hearing on 21st of October, they then present, we're going to take over and stop this prosecution. The principal legal advisor then turns up in the morning, and to be fair to him, he says, look, I'm neutral on this, yeah? If Mr. Doherty wants to go back to the High Court again, I'm good with a stay on this case, okay? Valerie Charbit then argues, she says, well, the defendant has had a psychological assessment, and at this point in time, she's just about able to stand trial. But who knows what might happen if this is delayed further, okay? At this, the judge then says, well, I'm accepting the, uh, the offer to, of no evidence in the case, and to protect the defendant's human rights because her right to a fair trial was, in his view, infringed on the fact that it had taken three years and hadn't come to trial. Now, case law on it says that 50 years isn't long enough to have a fair trial. Now, of course, the whole, all the spanners thrown in the works are from the CPS, etc., etc. Okay? Going back to, but the, this, this goes on now, the CPS are now in a lot of trouble now because they've signed a consent order in the High Court, signed and sealed in the High Court, that they will not get involved in this prosecution. So currently, they're in contempt of the High Court order, consent order, that they signed that they wouldn't get involved in this prosecution again. And it's going on. Coming back to... You can go to my website, justicenow.co.uk, and you can see all this material on there. Web of Lies, yeah? Uh, Journalist of the Year last year, Michael Gillard, wrote this article, Web of Lies, okay? And it's related to the grooming of my child, yeah, and the investigation that the police claimed that they did. They claimed that they met and spoke to a 15-year-old boy. Well, first off, an IPCC uh, investigator uh, who found and made a judgment in the IPCC that the police were negligent in that investigation and had failed to safeguard the children involved because it just wasn't, my, wasn't only my daughter. That was then overruled uh, by an individual called Rebecca Reed. Just type her name into Google and you'll find a whole heap of stuff about her. She's a nice, safe pair of hands at the IPCC. Uh, this article, Web Lies, published in 2010, October 2010, um, sets all that out, sets out that what Rebecca Reed was saying, that in her claim to overrule, that, that the police had met and spoken to a 15-year-old boy that they conclusively identified as being the person who was in contact with my daughter, uh, is not true. It took them three years to admit that on the threat of a private criminal prosecution. This, this, all this issue here about the Web of Lies article and um, Deborah Glass is the subject of a high court case in relation to a guy called Neil Wilby. And um, uh, it appears that Deborah Glass, uh, Deborah Glass uh, Rebecca Reed may have also been involved in trying to cover up um, Yorkshire Police's involvement with Jimmy Savile. So th this should all be coming out in relation to that. Um, IPCC. May 2012, 1st of May, Ian was there, a few other people were there. We set up the Abolish the IPCC. 
Uh, not that I give it much, much uh, credence, but the Labour Party has now adopted exactly what we were saying, that they will, if get elected, abolish the IPCC. This is a uh, scurrilous organisation, not all of the people, but certainly an organisation that is part of the establishment's uh, mechanisms to try and protect and cover up abuse of children, police misconduct, police violence, police criminality, false testimony, all of those things. That organisation is not there to protect you. So we did the coffin, RIP, IPCC. They loved it. <clears throat> Don't think as well that you're in a minority anymore. Yep. Since I started in 2008, and you know, I've known Ian for a long time and his cases and stuff like that, um, the cover-up culture with police. I mean, this was a Sky News survey where they said, do you think, the question put to people was, do you think there's a culture of cover-up to hide wrongdoings by some officers. 53% of this country, the people re responded, that they believe there is. 30% don't know. And only 18% said that they don't have a, a, a cover-up culture. I mean, that's, you're in the majority now. Back in 2008, I don't think we were, but by sort of continually pounding away and putting the truth out there, I think the wider gener uh, population are well aware of all of this stuff. Luton criminal prosecution. Look, private prosecutions is a very, very effective tool. Uh, it puts that person that, who thinks that they are sort of hidden by the, as Guy would say, the corporate skirt, yeah? They can hide behind the corporate skirt. These people are, are cowards, yeah? Bring them into, into, into trials. Now, this is not the only, the, the perverting course of justice trial is not the only one. I brought two, the two police officers who led the raid on my home. I brought them to court for, wait for it, Kidnap, false imprisonment, aggravated burglary, burglary, affray, assault, actual bodily harm, misconduct in public office. Seven charges for those two officers who led the raid to my house. Now, they must have thought I've taken leave of my senses, and I went to the magistrate's court opposite Uxbridge Police Station to do that. They brought their barristers, as usual, trying to argue a whole load of stuff. Said, He's made like 40 complaints about us. He's trying to turn this into a political movement and things like that to the judge. I said, look, it is a political issue, police corruption. I'm not turning it into one. And I said, as far as 40 complaints, I said, if it's 140 complaints, it makes no difference. Because at the root of this is the cover-up of those initial false allegations, yeah? And everything else has emanated out of it. Now, Dis District Judge Deborah Wright, good lady. She looks at the evidence that I was presenting for those charges against those officers, and she issues them all with a case to answer, which is a threshold within the court. She says, I'm issuing summons on all charges, albeit the uh, uh, aggravated, uh, aggravated burglary charge, because she thought I was using pieces of evidence twice, which I wasn't, but that's a different matter. All of those charges issued with case to answer. It then gets sucked up into Southwark Crown Court before... Lord Justice McCreeth. So if you come across Lord Justice McCreeth, he's uh, the sort of highest judge in Southwark Crown Court. And uh, as he told me, Mr. Doherty, any more private prosecutions you start, they'll all be coming to me. Now, he's instrumental in shutting down the prosecutions in relation to uh, it, within the court uh, in conjunction with his little CPS colleagues. <clears throat> but not to worry. This is not the point. The point is, going into those courts and showing those courts that they, even the courts, cannot do the right thing when faced with the evidence of people's criminality. They'll get you, but they won't get their little dogs. Okay. Interestingly, in the courts, something that not many people know, my original trial, when I was being prosecuted for harassment, got moved from Uxbridge, outside the local justice area of Uxbridge, and moved to Hendon. <clears throat> CPS didn't ask for it to happen. Court didn't order it to happen. It just moved on its own. Many years later, it's a fact on the, and we'll talk about the synchronicity thing. Uh, I, I can't believe it happened, but it happened. On the day of the dis dismissal application, I got seven days to get a high court order staying the criminal prosecution while I did a judicial review of that decision to try and stop it by Richard Newcomb. I go to London on the train from Luton, and I'm going back to Luton to get my car. I get onto the train at um, St Pancras, and a girl gets on the train uh, in, the, in the carriage. I'm standing there. And it was, just happened to be the train that gets, stops at Kentish Town. And just before we get to Kentish Town, she says to me, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll we'll chat with you. I said, okay. And she says, I've got to tell you that the clerk in your case, his name is Jonathan Wetrich. 
at Hendon. And he's an ex-police officer. I'm like, okay, who are you? Uh, I've got to get off, and she gets off the train. Sure enough, it checks out. Jonathan Wetrich, the clerk in the case, which clearly involved serious police corruption, was an ex-metropolitan police officer. Clearly, he didn't make any disclosure like that during, his, during the trial. But it's clear, within the courts themselves, of course, they call them the police courts, the magistrates' courts, they were moving cases so that they've got a nice, safe pair of hands sitting on the helm in the court case because the clerk has an awful lot of control of the case. So Jonathan Wetrich, which I'm sure you'll listen to this at some point, you know, everyone knows you're an ex-police officer. Now, you're involved in a case which is going on and on. Uh, it's got serious police corruption. And there's a lot of questions to ask. That complaint went all the way to the head of HM, HMCTS, to Peter Hancock, okay, of HMCTS, about Jonathan Wetrich being in it, and his answer was, he can't see any impropriety. <laughs> These people are blind. Um, Peter Hancock has. Oh, good, good riddance. Well, I think, you know, you know, when they say rats leaving a sinking ship, you know, look at it. These people, the retirements around my case are staggering. There, there really isn't anyone else employed around me. And, you know, they, they sort of try and treat, well, I, I think, you know, there's, I'm just doing the right thing, yeah? And I think they're very scared of me doing the right thing. But that's fine. Um, they've, as most whistleblowers will find, they'll attack you, Yeah. Um, pre-trial threats at, uh, in a London park to my sister-in-law. This is how brave these people are. Um, and interestingly, they picked her because she was quite a, a big confidant of mine at the time, yeah, or confidant. Um, Stitch Up and Stevenage, look at it. Look, go and look at it online. There's a load of stuff about that, and it's sequel in St. Albans. I, I'm allegedly at the moment a criminal. I have a charge of um, Section 57 of the Courts Act 2003, an assault of a court security, a designated court security officer. Problem for them is, we, we had a magistrate's court hearing, again, where I produced audio recording and showed what, ev what they said, because I'd recorded myself going into the court, was complete and utter bunkum, yeah? Um, we've got one of the witnesses saying, oh, I, saw, I saw a punch, and I asked him what was in my hand at the time, nice little simple one, uh, I didn't see your hand, I only saw your arm from the wrist to the elbow, well, then how did you know it was a punch? Well, that's obvious. But, of course, they just find you guilty anyway. We went to St. Albans. I then had a, bar a barrister doing the case, which I sacked, because I wanted to watch them and see what they were up to. I sacked him uh, towards the end of it. But we got through the halfway point when the prosecution has closed. I won't bore you with too much detail on this, but we get through to the prosecution close of case. They close the case. When it reopens again a month later, this is how my case in the three days in the magistrate's court became nine days in the Crown Court for an assault that, even at highest of his allegations, I didn't touch anybody. I was being thrown out of the court at the time. Um, it's proved. Prosecution, we opened again, and I said, well, look, we haven't even proved he's a designated court security officer, which the, the court agreed. So he said, well, we, the CPS can go off and find some evidence, even though they've closed the case. Um, case law says that you can't reopen a case to remedy prosecutorial failures, yeah? He'd failed to prove his case, but yet the judge allows them to go off and find new evidence. So they went to HMCTS to find out, and for policemen in this room, the first wave of police privatization, the, uh, the court's security, um, given over to companies like G4S, Serco, and all of that, Mighty. These people aren't trained. Now, the, the law on them says that they have to be designated by the Lord Chancellor. So they go to the HMCTS and say, well, provide us the prosecution, give us the evidence. Well, they would love to give the evidence that this man was a designated court security officer, but he wasn't. So we never ever had any evidence from HMCTS that this man was a designated court security officer because he wasn't. A question that's in Hansard, they ask, my MP asked the question, can you tell me how many people were designated by the Lord Chancellor in every year since 2006? HMCTS's answer in Hansard is that we have no record of anyone prior to 2009 being designated. Well, this guy... Nigel Carter, is in court telling them that he was designated in 2007. Um, anyway, so that stitch up in Stevenage. They said, I'm, I'm guilty of that. They made me £3,500 fine and all of this stuff. For, for, anyway, the, it, it goes on. Oh, yeah, and, and in, I've, I've had an internal... Uh, the Met Police were, set, were seeking to collect evidence on me and also to use ASBO legislation to stop me doing what I was doing. 
They haven't done that to date. <clears throat> I think it makes a very important point. The police do not have a monopoly on the investigation of crime, and the state prosecutors do not have a monopoly on the prosecution of crime. We think, well, the police are the only ones who can do it. No, they're not. We can do it. Groups can do it. Anyone can do it. And we can also prosecute, yeah? Now, currently, my belief, yeah, and uh, quite a few uh, legal uh, people that I know uh, come around to my view of thinking, is that the CPS are in breach of the Competitions Act because they, by a long way, hold a monopoly of prosecutions in this country. And they are abusing their position, yeah? Because I, when you ask them, how many prosecutions have you closed down? Well, they haven't got any answers. I know six prosecutions you've closed down of mine. I think they're worried about the competition, don't you, Guy? And basically, if they exercise their power as a monopoly, which has, a, has as their object or effect the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition within the United Kingdom, they're in breach of the Competitions Act. Now, I've already laid uh, papers in the High Court in relation to this, and the, the master there in the High Court, yeah, no problem, stamp that. He said, a very interesting argument, Mr. Doherty. So the CPS, how can they hold a monopoly and I think in the future what should happen is that the police, when they've done a good investigation, might come to you and say, as the victim of crime, we've got in your area the state prosecutor, we've got Justice Now, and we've got Mr. Taylor, prosecutor, who's got like a 97% success rate. Which one would you like to use? <laughs> but Section 6 of the Prosecutions Offenders Act gives them the right to take over and very specifically, continue the prosecution. And it's a bit like saying if you had the right to continue my journey home, it doesn't mean you can terminate my journey. You ought to continue my journey to wherever I was going. I was going to Brighton. Well, you, you can't go off to Manchester. So it's very clear about continue the prosecution. They misinterpret that and say, well, that gives us the right to stop it. And what we've got there is a very, very clear separations of powers issue, another constitutional principle in this country, that the separation between the executive, the judiciary, and the legislator. We've got the executive arm of government, the CPS, reaching into the courts and saying, sorry courts, but you, you don't have the, the ability to supervise this court case. We're taking it off you. Are these people so scared that they cannot allow the courts of this land to adjudicate on what's weak and what shouldn't be going to trial. Because as far as I could see in my cases, the court themselves wanted those cases to go to trial. The CPS obviously fought differently. I'm sure they were lent on. Please, please stop this. But uh, yeah, bashing the bishop. <laughs> Let's talk about the synchrony. How, how much longer have I got? Just give me a, five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I'll rush through it. But synchronicity, okay? If I wasn't spiritual before all this stuff started, well, I am now. I, um, there's some involvement of the, the Catholic Church in some stuff going on with my daughter. It's all interlinked. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but it um, involves her school. And again, involves an audio recording. involves a whole load of lies that are provable. The... Bishop of, of Westminster became involved, yeah? He said he wasn't, it's nothing to do with me, Mr. Doherty, but because it's the school. The school organized their own things. Uh, we're nothing to do. I said, well, that's a problem for you, Bishop, because you sent a legal advisor to the governor's meeting, and your, your legal advisor called that meeting to a close when it was shown that your people were lying. Okay, I'll meet with you. So he meets with me. I go meet him. And uh, during that, I did ask him, are you a man of God? To which he just looked at me. But like, don't, you know, I, I'm respectful of authority, but I'm not respectful of people who will, you know, be dis act dishonorably. Um, now, what happens in that, he says he was going to do an investigation. He then comes back in double quick time, a couple of months later, and says, we've done an investigation, everything's okay. I said, okay, but it's all emails. I said, okay, can I see a copy of the report? No, nope, it's not written in a report. I said, okay, could you even tell me who did the investigation? No, nope, we're not telling you. So I thought, that's quite, that's quite interesting. And I did write back to him, and we'll go to Field O'Connell. He said about the Ninth Commandment, um, the Ninth Commandment, which is, thou shalt not bear false witness. I actually emailed the bishop in it, and I said, you know, as a man, a supposed man of God, do you not believe in the Ninth Commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness, which is at the center of all of this. And 
I kid you not, he emails me back and says, I don't like the aggressive tone of your email. <laughs> so I can just imagine Moses coming down from, is it Mount Sinai? With his tablet of stone. And when he got to nine, Moses, you're a very aggressive little man. Go away with your Ten Commandments. Bishop John Arnold, who's the name of this chap, he was appointed by Benedict to investigate, go and check it out, to investigate Ealing Abbey. Ealing Abbey was about 50 years of child abuse. One of the priests was allowed bail to leave the country while he was under investigation. Uh, he disappeared, funny enough. They think he's hidden somewhere in the Vatican. But Bishop John Arnold was appointed to investigate what went on in Ealing Abbey. <clears throat> now, I then fire in a data protection request to the church and say, okay, let's see, let's, let's see your cards, boys. And I get an email back in November 2013 from Bishop John Arnold. And this man was a trained barrister, ex-Oxford graduate. Yeah? And I, I completely go with the, my Irish brother. Uh, I'm not the most educated person, but I'm fairly good. Uh, but this man was Oxford graduate barrister before he became, went into the church and became a bishop. Now, he emailed me, and in the email, paraphrase it, it says, Mr. Doggy, we have got stuff that under data protection we ought to give to you, but we're not going to give it to you because you're going to litigate against us, and as we've got no more use for it, we're going to destroy it. It's in an email. I go to uh, the, the court, I go to, funny enough, Luton County Court, get a nice judge, he was okay, uh, show him the email, all my papers set up for an injunction. I get an injunction on the whole Diocese of Westminster and Bishop John Arnold. The injunction states that whilst my rights are being determined as to my rights to that information, they must not destroy the information. Yep, that's in dispute. And um, I call it altar service. What I do with that injunction, it was, it was around about Christmas time, so I thought, okay, I'll wrap it up in Christmas wrapping paper and I take it to Westminster Cathedral. Again, a bit of synchronicity. I've told some other people here today. I go to Westminster Cathedral. My idea, I don't want to be sacrilegious or anything like that, but I'm going to go during communion, because it's obviously open for business at that time, and I'm going to <laughs> serve the summons during communion, okay, in Westminster Cathedral, wrapped in wrapping paper. So I go there. I know it's Sunday. But I, won't, I haven't been struck down yet. On Sunday, I'm sitting at the back of the church. I've got a guy, some guys filmed it, and I, I'm like thinking, you know, really, I shouldn't do this. And it's, not very, it's not really good, blah, blah, blah. I think, what would Jesus do? He'd kick them all out, but, you know, maybe I shouldn't do it. And then I've been to church many times, but I've never heard this uh, responsorial psalm. It said, in his day, justice will prevail, and there will be peace on earth. And I thought, okay, dude, you clearly want me to do this, yeah? <laughs> so... Bolstered by that, I get up, I go to, up to communion, I say, get to the front, I say, Father, will you bless me? Get a blessing. And I say, Father, you must take this, this, this is a court, this is an injunction on the <laughs> Diocese of Westminster. It's an important court dog. And he said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not taking it. And I said, well, you must take it, it's the summons, I'm serving you. Uh, <laughs> altar service. And he says, I was an altar boy at some time. And I say, look, uh, you've got to take it. I said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave it on the altar for you to pick up after service. Yes, yes, do that. So I put it on the altar and left. Served. Um, they then come to court, cut it all briefly. They come to court. They completely make a hash of the whole case. They, I, I, I beat them in court. And on October the 15th, last year, 2014, they were ordered within 40 days to disclose, very biblical, 40 days to give me the information that I'm seeking. Um, to date, they've still not done that. Yeah, they're now in contempt of court. Clearly, they're hiding something, which is dishonorable. Uh, the <coughs> Metropolitan Police, I have been told, uh, very recently raised a crime reference number in relation to Bishop John Arnold and a report that I made that he, if you, if, you, if you have evidence in your possession that you know is related to criminal proceedings and then you sought to destroy it, that's called perverting the course of justice, whether it's civil or criminal proceedings. In that email, he sets out very clearly his intention to destroy material that he knows will lead to litigation. That's perverting the course of justice. Now, they've raised that crime reference number against Bishop John Arnold, who is, funny enough, moved from Westminster. He's now the Bishop of Salford. So I think he's anyone from Manchester. Now he's your new bishop up there. Uh, he was in Cambodia for about two months, and I know that we don't have any extradition treaties with Cambodia, so he, I, I, he went hiding out there. Okay, so...
Plebgate, I've really got to get this one to you. Plebgate, Operation Alice, yeah? This is very, very important. And Times newspaper, Independent, have an injunction on this. And it's related to me, funny enough, at the centre of it all. Plebgate, which is obviously Andrew Mitchell, what happened outside 10 Downing Street, okay? Completely separate. I don't know nothing about Plebgate because it hasn't started yet. In April 2012, I go to a police station in Holborn. I go and see, funny enough, a guy called Inspector Gary Randall. I take him with papers and I say, Deborah Glass, Commissioner, now Ombudswoman in Australia, has perverted the course of justice, committed misconduct in public office because she tried to cover up the crimes of the Metropolitan Police. And I say, here's the evidence, here's the triage of the IPCC by Director Derek Braddon, which says that the evidence presented is, is uh, that the police member of staff painted a picture of harassment that's not borne out by the evidence provided, therefore it needs to be a managed investigation. It then falls into Deborah Glass's hands, and she doesn't even think it merits suspicion of a crime to commence a criminal investigation, i.e. interview and periphery investigation. She decides in her report that it was simply a mistake. On the other side of Deborah Glass, in the Crown Court court papers, we've got a Crown Court judge who's looked at the evidence and said this is compelling evidence of and needs to go to trial. So I say, dear Inspector Randall, and he said, look, Mr. Docky, I think you've got something there. I said, why don't you just, because it's only around the corner, why don't you get one of your PCs, nip in, arrest her, and bring her in for interview, which he found very funny. But to be, be fair to him, he was quite a good guy. He raised it as a crime reference number. Metropolitan Police didn't know what to do with it. And what happened with that investigation... And let you people decide whether you think it's highly dodgy. The Metropolitan Police then, in October the 1st, 2012, they wanted to speak to me. They wanted to meet me in a five-star hotel in London to take statements from me about Deborah Glass. And uh, Plebgate had kicked off on the 19th of September, and obviously the Met Police knew that they're going to start coming under scrutiny, and a person who's going to come under scrutiny will be Deborah Glass. We need shit on Deborah Glass, is I, what I think happened. They then come to me, they take this, they tell me, we're the boys, we're SCO8, uh, we investigate politicians for cash questions and all of this stuff. We are the boys, and we're doing this investigation. So, right, cool, leave it with them. After a month or so, I realise you're up to your old tricks again. They can't be trusted. And I say, look, Metropolitan Police, how can you possibly investigate her covering up your crimes? This is ridiculous. You need to send it out to at least an alternative police force to look at this. They refused. Commander Alan Gibson, now retired, uh, he took the decision to retain it within the Metropolitan Police. Now, what's the chances of this? I'm all into synchronicity, but what's the chances of this? That that investigation into Deborah Glass continued from April 2012 all the way through uh, 2013, all the way up to November the 26th, 2013. At 10.32, I get an email from the Metropolitan Police which says, we're dropping the investigation into Deborah Glass. Funny enough, at 12 o'clock that day, the Operation Alice report into Plebgate was issued by the CPS. So, of course, if they were using it to hold over Deborah Glass, dear Debbie, if there's any problems with you and you don't do what you're told, you know Mr. Dockett, he's a feisty character, and he'll be more than up for prosecuting you. Uh, you better behave yourself, Debbie, I think, and then down swords. We don't need the Mexican standoff anymore. We don't need that investigation anymore because we've got the outcome in Operation Alice. And just to give you an indication on how bad Operation Alice was compromised, Keith Wallace, who went to jail yeah, for misconduct in public office, which is a very bizarre standalone charge, was never interviewed. He had mental problems, and he couldn't be interviewed. Yeah? Too, Ill. Too ill to be interviewed. But these guys are running around the streets of London a few days earlier with uh, Heckler and Koch sub-automatic machine guns. Yeah? Also, if you read the report, Officer 15, exactly the same thing, came to interview, was very agitated, and a doctor said he was not fit to be interviewed. Now, that was a year before the close of Operation Alice. I mean, how ill was this guy? Because he was never interviewed. They didn't say, go home, mate, put a cold towel on your head, chill out, and come back tomorrow, you know? So that's, that's how they're compromised. They don't interview these people and stuff like that. So that's Plebgate. Um, Pipu, I didn't even know, in my experience with the police, I didn't even know Pipu existed. PIPU is the Police Integrity and Powers Unit of the Home Office. They have the power to investigate the head of the IPCC, Dame Ann Owers. Dame Ann Owers was asked by the Home, by Home Affairs Select Committee. I've got all the material. There's lots of good people who pass me stuff. Um, I've got the letter from the Home Affairs Select Committee to Deborah, Dame Ann Owers asking her, what is this about this investigation into 
Deborah Glass. She writes back and says, nope, nothing to worry about, totally spurious allegations, which, spurious, I'm an engineer, Phil Connell, spurious means false. So she's suggesting I made false allegations against Deborah Glass? I don't think so. Now, it's, she misled Parliament, yeah? Pipu is now actively investigating Dame Anne Owers. So it just keeps going up the tree. Um, no one is above the law. There's, just confirm what I'm saying. There's the, one of the court orders from Luton County Court, which says Michael Doherty, Bishop John Arnold, and the Roman Catholic Diocese of Westminster. Yeah, and obviously says this is the October one, which says that they must disclose this material to me. And they're just ignoring it. Damien Thompson, who's the editor of The Spectator, has actually tweeted a picture of this, or, this order to Westminster Diocese and said, I think it's about time you started asking questions about this order that's going around on the internet. They are, of course, and I fully agree with it, they are exercising their right to silence, which is another common law right. Austerity for us, but not for them. There's some cases you want to look up. Neil Wilby, which is the IPCC, a really good journalist. The IPCC has taken a high court order out against him or trying to get high court harassment case against him. Rebecca Reed's involved in it, and I've seen some of the internal documentation within it. They're very worried about private criminal prosecutions. I wonder why. Tim Hicks, Nigel Ward, police in uh, Yorkshire have taken another high court case, harassment case against these two journalists. These two journalists are key in the exposure of the Jimmy Savile uh, and Giaconelli and other, other cases of child abuse, yeah? They're now, they have the temerity to take a criminal action against the people that blew the whistle on it all. So far, they've spent in excess of 400,000 pounds on that, that court action. 400,000 of your money. And Boris Johnson, talking about money. Boris Johnson, it's come full circle. My corruption stuff started in Uxbridge constituency, okay? That's Uxbridge Police, Division of the Metropolitan Police. Straight into the, the trap, into the affray, is Boris Johnson, who's decided he's going to stand as parliamentary candidate in Uxbridge. Well, I'd be duty-bound to stand against him uh, in Uxbridge. And um, some of the questions I will be asking Boris is, why did Boris authorise the payment of £60,000 for the de legal defence of Tracy Jane Murphy, the police commander of Hillenden Secretary? At the same time, that Tory mayor and the Tories are saying that you are not entitled to legal aid to a fair defence, yeah? They've stripped legal aid across the country, yet if you're one of theirs, you'll get the very finest of legal funding. £60,000. The case hadn't even come to trial. I expect they've paid a lot more than £60,000. That £60,000 also included a figure of about 15000 for, in their words, retrospective legal work done in 2011. Well, the mayor's office didn't exist in 2011, so he was paying their solicitors prior to And the problem, the reason was there is because the Public Commercial Service Union, they were initially funding her criminal defence until I pointed out that there wasn't any clause within the members' uh, benefits that allowed them to pay member funds to a uh, member for criminal defence. Uh, they obviously sidestepped, got out of the way, but the solicitors, they got paid from Boris Johnson. So I'm going to be standing, putting my name in thing. I have no political aspirations, which I think is a good thing, but um, I think that gives people the choice. Do you want to vote for someone that you can identify with, or do you want to vote for someone like Boris Johnson, who is a proven thug, if you've ever heard his tapes, where he's um, plotting to get the address for someone to be beaten up, and, can, and the, the man should be prosecuted for that. You know, it's clear conspiracy to commit violence against somebody. Uh, but he still, you know, has aspirations. And I think in his book, he wants to be the leader of the world. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much.